Hey, I'm Kelly Hogan, and I am a recovered and probably forever recovering sugar addict. I used to crave sugar, processed foods, starches, pasta, bread. Oh my gosh, carbs, all of the carbs. My husband and I used to go out to eat every single night. We didn't have kids. We were both teachers. And that's just how we decided to spend our money was going out for uh, all of the unlimited breadsticks, pasta bowls. Let's split a dessert. Oh my gosh, where do you want to go tonight? It was that was the highlight of our day and our life was just going out. And yeah, it was kind of fun. It was tasty. It was delicious. It was something to look forward to every day. <sighs> uh, on the flip side, the flip side, back then I was obese. I did not feel good when my alarm went off in the morning. Was, oh my gosh, I couldn't wait to get into bed at night. Uh, during the day, I was thinking about food. I, if there was a treat nearby, if there was sugar anywhere at a staff meeting for the teachers, if there were donuts in the break room, even though I knew I was struggling so bad with weight and I knew good and well why I was struggling with weight. Hello. I know it's got to be all the treats and the sugar and the carbs. I didn't know specifically what I needed, but I had a pretty good idea that those foods were hurting me and keeping me from having the life and the results that I wanted. I can't be eating them anyway. That's addiction. When you know that something is not for your best and you really want to stop, but you can't, you don't, not for long anyway, and you keep finding yourself right back into those foods, that is addiction. And that was me. And I've had people say to me, but you don't understand how addicted I am. I'm like, I think I do, friend. I really do. I have been asked many times through the years. How did you do it? Kelly, how did you get off of it? Because I've tried and I've tried and I just can't stop. All right. I've, I have a list. I don't even know how many. Let's hope it's about 20. That sounds like a nice number. So step one for me was I was desperate. I mean, I felt like I had tried a lot of different things. So when my doctor first offered me some solutions and he told me, Kelly, you're inflamed. I don't need to see it on your lab work. I can tell by looking at you, the fact that you've got these boils, uh, your weight, everything about you just screams inflammation. I also had a lot of redness and skin tags, acne, uh, costochondritis, which is inflammation of the sternum. I had a lot of problems. He knew it was inflammation. All of that amounted to me being desperate. I needed an answer. I had a why, so I'm going to encourage you, if you aren't desperate yet, but you know you should be, reflect. Where is this going, this path that you're on? Don't just look at where you are today. What is this going to look like in 20 years? Get a little bit desperate and understand you need this. Reflect upon your why. If you need to write it out, why this matters, because the voice of addiction and self-sabotage is going to eventually show up and tell you this doesn't matter. It's not that big of a deal. It does. It's a really big deal, actually. Next, I want you to fill your brain with hope. Y'all, there are a lot of people who have made it through this. I'm going to link in the video description box to some amazing stories of people who probably started off worse than you, people who were immobile, people who were bigger than you, people who were more addicted than you, and they made it through allow your brain to be flooded instead of letting your brain to go to a place of jealousy like oh, well I'm glad that's happened for them it hasn't happened for me yet yet so give your brain some hope hope abounds that could be me this works look how well this works I can do this the next step is one that I didn't take at first but my gosh, I wish I had. Avoid all sweet tastes. For the first five years that I did an almost carnivore diet, I kept in diet sodas, sugar-free gum, sugar-free breath mints, sugar-free, sugar-free jello. Uh, it seemed at the time like, ah, oh, these things are saving me, They're keeping me from real carbs. And maybe that's true. Also, it kept me wanting sugar for five years. I was not free. I had cravings. I didn't really want meat. I really wanted more sugar-free junk all day, every day. So my encouragement is when you feel ready, 
cutting out all things that taste sweet is actually going to be a huge gift to yourself. I hear it every single month in every one of my groups. If I ask people, show of hands, how many of you have cut out all sweet tasting things? Hands go up. And then how many of you feel like it was an amazing thing to do for yourself that it's been worth it? People are like this on the screen. <laughs> yes. And then I'll say, how many of you aren't there yet? Sheepish hands go up. I say, that's okay. But if it feels helpful to you at the moment to keep those things, do what you got to do. But that's where I eventually had to go in order to get food peace. No sweet tastes. Okay, number four, eat enough. You, there are only three macronutrients on this earth. Carbohydrates, which I no longer eat, and maybe you won't either. Fat and protein. Carbs, fat, and protein. Two of these are required. It's the fat and the protein. <laughs> the carbs are not necessary, but when we cut them out, the other two become a lot more important. Where could we possibly get fat and protein? It's meat. We can get it in meat and eggs. And eating enough of those becomes incredibly important. I do work with my group members on how to figure out their TDEE, their total daily energy expenditure, so that they can estimate how much they need to eat per day based on their age, size, activity level, and gender. Once they have done that, then we try to figure out, okay, what would that look like? So figuring out how much your body needs to eat of meat is important. If you are hungry, yes, you're going to have cravings for sugar. You're going to have cravings for everything. You need food. You just need enough food. I would say start there. Get enough meat so that you feel energetic and you feel like taking the walk and you can sleep through the night and you aren't craving carbs. If you have those things, no carb cravings, you're sleeping well through the night and you have good energy to take the walk, congratulations. You're probably eating enough. My next tip is to get all the junk out of your house, which would be a great place to start, actually. But also get it out of your eyes and your brain and your nose. Avoid seeing, smelling, thinking about it, the carbs and the sugar for as, as much as possible, especially in those first few weeks. If you can avoid going to the bakeries and the Italian restaurants and the staff room with all of the donuts there stay away, turn it off when there are commercials. These are, we've already established, these are addictive foods that are holding you back from the life that you really want. So I would stop letting it get into your head because it is a trigger. And once we start thinking about it, our dopamine levels go up and we're like in seeking mode. Squash that. You haven't even tasted it yet. You may not have even smelled it. It could be on a commercial, but you are anticipating something that you really want because in the past, it gave you a dopamine hit. So your dopamine is like, yeah, baby. And this anticipatory dopamine is not a bad thing. It's what puts us into seeking mode, which for a lot of things is good. If you're hungry and you think about steak, you get this anticipatory dopamine, it drives you to seek the steak. This is what would lead someone to go out and hunt a cow or meat sales at the grocery store. But seeking is a good thing, unless what you are then seeking is something that hurts you and harms you. So when this anticipatory dopamine does start to rise, Whatever you do while it is elevated, you will start to crave more of. So if you give in and eat that thing, you have reinforced it. You will now want it more every single time that anticipatory dopamine rises. It'll be like Pavlov's dog. The bell rings and you just want that thing. That's what's being reinforced. But while your dopamine is up, if you make a different choice and you either eat the steak or the bacon or the eggs, you take the walk you do some reading, you do some praying, whatever it is you do in that moment while your dopamine is already up, you will start to crave that. It may take more than one or two times, but you will. I will link below to a video all about anticipatory dopamine and how to use it to your advantage to break up with any addictive substance. If someone is really struggling to get off of carbs or trying to break up, especially with binge eating those carbs, I strongly encourage people to eat three meals per day, three adequate meals per day. I don't mean like a little nibble of pepperoni here. Get satisfied. I do not need you to eat past satiety when you feel 
I feel good and satisfied. If you do that three times per day, you are so much less likely to give in to cravings. You are so much less likely to binge eat anything. Just remind yourself, I ate breakfast. And in a few hours, when I get hungry, I will eat lunch. And then a few hours after that, when I'm hungry, I will eat dinner. I know there are some people who thrive eating one to two times per day, and that's great when it works. I have been a total carnivore for 13 years, and I still find that I do wonderfully eating. I eat three meals per day. I have at times had long stretches where I didn't want breakfast, but I'm currently, for quite a while now, have been eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I do not feel tempted by any carbohydrates, any desire to binge. Even as a carnivore, I used to binge on dairy, not all the time, but also not just rarely. I would sometimes have way more dairy than I needed and would feel icky afterwards. Like, why did I do that? Three meals per day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner has just put an end to that. I'm just satisfied and eating enough and it does help with cravings and binge tendencies. The next tip is move, move your body, move your body. I used to tell folks who are new to breaking up with carbs, just start with the food. Don't worry about any movement aspect yet. We've all heard abs are made in the kitchen. Yep, here's what I didn't know. Research now is confirmed. In fact, a huge meta-analysis where they looked at 22 independent studies that were all done on addiction, mostly on very hard addictions, alcohol, drug abuse. But yes, this also applies to processed foods and sugars, anything you're addicted to. What they found was the, the treatment programs that included purposeful physical exercise as part of the treatment were 70% more effective at the people not only being more compliant and breaking the addiction, yep, but also they reported that it was easier, fewer withdrawal symptoms, less anxiety, and less depression. They did it better and it was easier. Total win. And if you're thinking, yeah, but I hate running, I hate treadmill. Uh, me too. Horrible. I'm not doing that. What do I do? I walk. I walk a lot. I walk when I can. And even if you have a really busy schedule, if you could find even one meal time of the day to afterwards take a walk, if you do that after your biggest meal of the day, you are going to get the benefit of breaking up with carbs easier, but you are also going to get a 22% reduction in the glucose spike after that meal than if you didn't take the walk. That's better than metformin. Also, no bad side effects. Take the walk. My next tip for breaking up with sugar and carbs is redefine comfort food and redefine a treat. I know we're used to thinking of comfort food as being like macaroni and cheese or ice cream. I know. I did too. And now I see comfort food as a big plate of fried eggs. Oh, I love fried eggs. It's just swimming in butter or steak with butter on top, a carnivore creme brulee, there's carnivore ice cream, but also comfort does not have to come in the form of food. I can be comforted by a walk to the meadow. I can be comforted by a good song. I can be comforted by Bible verses, by a prayer, by sleep, by a long hug. There are so many ways to get true comfort that don't hurt me afterwards and the ways I used to get comfort weren't even real comfort because afterwards they hurt my body I feel nauseated I had IBS I had cravings I had the boils the obesity that's not real comfort so redefine comfort food and when you think to yourself I just need a treat it doesn't have to be something that hurts you next tip salt water and or just electrolytes in general. Sometimes people have cravings, cravings, cravings because they're just really thirsty. They haven't had enough electrolytes and one of those is sodium. So having some salt could help. Um, sodium, potassium, magnesium. I know it can be really hard to get those things in balance at first, but if we are really low in those and it doesn't mean you have to take an electrolyte packet, one of the best ways you can get enough of these things is to just eat enough. But Staying hydrated, using some salt if it makes you feel better, using the electrolytes if it helps get your energy back can also help with cravings for some people too. I do not take electrolytes. 
I am not pushing those. I don't sell them. I have no affiliation. I'm just saying if they make you feel better in the beginning and help to get rid of cravings, sometimes they are helpful. I will also link below to two different supplements, including inositol, which I have never even tried, but a lot of people have said it does take the edge off of cravings when they are first starting. So I'll link to them. Again, not affiliated, but if it's helpful, do it for a while. You probably will not need to do any of those things forever. Another way to squash cravings is add variety. People sometimes say, I'm just sick to death of these burger patties. Why are y'all eating burger patties? I love burger patties. I love steak, burger patties, fried eggs. I could eat those on repeat forever. Oh, and pork belly. <laughs> but there's so much variety. If you do fine with mustard seasonings, some hot sauce, great. If you do wonderful with seafood, oh, that opens a lot of doors. I love seafood. So many reasons to add seafood to your carnivore diet. Seafood, pork, beef, lamb. There are a lot of critters out there. It's them all to your benefit. The more varied our nutrients are from a variety of animal sources, Many people report that they have fewer cravings because you're just checking off so many boxes. So mix it up, make it interesting, or make it really easy. If you like to batch cook, you know, 100 burgers a week and just eat off of those, however it works for you, there is no right or wrong way, especially when it comes to variety on a carnivore diet. The next tip is deal with stress. You may not be able to get rid of the stressor, but if you can Find ways to deal with the stressors in your life, such as, yes, take the walk. <laughs> Eating good foods, that's one way to relieve stress because you're keeping out toxins from your body. Doing some breath work is proven, proven to help lower our cortisol, getting sunshine, eating fish with those omega-3 fatty acids. In fact, eat some fish in the sun and then take a walk. It's so good when it comes to our stress. Talk it out, pray it out, journal it out. Nature, reflection, time to yourself, sleep at night. All of these are so good. Also, you know what's really stressful, even if we don't think it is? Blue light shining in our eyes all day from our devices. Uh, so blue blocking glasses at night and natural sunlight in the morning all help to bring down stress. And why does that matter? Because the stress centers in our brain are located directly next to the craving centers of our brain. So when we are stressed, we are then craving. Also, if you do keep eating sugar and you start giving into these cravings, you will also likely find that you are also then more stressed. They feed off of each other. If we can squash the stress, just calm down, calm our bodies, calm our nervous systems, get out these things from our past that have been really hurtful and keeping our body in this traumatic, elevated, tense place. We will also find that our cravings for toxic, addictive junk settle down as well. Okay, next I want you to think about the full effects of whatever your kryptonite is. If your kryptonite is, say, ice cream. I want you to think about the full effects, especially before you get lit up like a Christmas tree with cravings. Think it through regularly. What does that do to you, that product, that ice cream? Does it lead you to want more and more and more and become obsessed? Does eating more and more and more lead to belly aches, binge episodes? Is it messing up your skin? Is it messing with your weight? What is the full effect? If you were to give into that, would it make your steak taste lame and bland for the next five days what does it do as my friend joanne ozig says what is the full package entail not just the 15 seconds of putting it in your mouth but the next 15 days how will it affect you and your success how will it affect your results if you keep eating it for the next 15 years like the full effects think it through just all the way through and if you do think it through and you know for sure, this is not best for me. I don't want this for myself. Uh, instead of just keeping it there and staring at it and making this long and drawn out process of I'm not going to eat it. I'm not going to eat it. Just stop. If you can't just get rid of it and keep it out of your house completely and you find yourself alone with the product, destroy it. 
I had to do it. I had to dish soap some things. Just throwing cake in the trash was not dead enough for me. I had to really kill it dead. Dish soap. It takes just a quick moment of destroying this thing. This thing that we've already established hurts your body. This thing that is giving results that you do not want. Just have one moment of strength. Dead. Next tip to breaking carb addiction is find healthy ways to get your dose of endorphins, dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin. I share with my groups many ways to get these substances, these happy, feel-good chemicals into your brain without having to use addictive substances. Things from exercise, laughter, dance, doing something creative, even spicy food helps if you can handle spiciness. Put some on that steak, delicious, or your fried eggs. Listening to upbeat music, a good night's sleep, some just nice human interaction, conversation, looking eye to eye. That is a dopamine hit right there. There are so many ways to bring joy into your life that do not include tobacco, drugs, alcohol, or sugary addictive substances that harm your body. Next, get educated. If you are struggling to get started, it may be because you don't fully understand the harmful effects of insulin staying elevated and what all of these glucose spikes all day long are doing to your insulin and while keeping insulin anything above a nine is harmful for your heart anything above a six is going to make it hard for you to lose weight optimal being five or below if you don't know how to get your fasting insulin checked i will link to the video on what is insulin? Why does it matter? And how to get it checked easily, even without your doctor. This is not the same as a finger prick on a glucose test at home. This is a fasting insulin score. If you don't know about it, get educated. If you aren't educated about the processed food companies and how they came over from the tobacco companies, their CEOs got into the processed food business with their same business model. I will also link below to a video that I made showing the information behind what are these companies doing and how much money are they spending to keep you a customer that is wholly and fully addicted even though they know good and well that the next place you will need to go is to their other business, which is pharmaceuticals. Get educated so we can get off of this horrible cycle of junk food and junk meds and eat real food and get real comfort and real healing. Next, it can be very helpful to learn what true hunger is. True hunger is not picky. It doesn't say, oh, but I just really want this one thing. True hunger is like, I don't care what it is. I just need to eat right now. Now I am picky about what I eat because I want to feel good. And I know that if I get wheat or soy whatsoever, my anxiety comes flooding back immediately and I will be up with leg cramps. That's not being picky. It's called being smart and a little bit particular. You know, this is when we say, I don't want burger patties or bacon or eggs. I don't want steak. I don't want the omelet. Gosh, you know what I'm really wanting? The word is craving. You know what I'm really craving? And then it's something that doesn't necessarily make you feel your best. That's not true hunger. True hunger would be thrilled for those burger patties. True hunger would say, oh, bacon, eggs. Oh my gosh, I'm so hungry. Yes, thank you. I, I will take them all gladly. If none of those foods sound good, good news, you are not hungry. You may in fact be lonely or bored. You may be anxious or overwhelmed. You may be tired. You may be angry or stressed, sad. Do you know what won't fix any of that? Food, especially junky food. It's not gonna fix that. So yes, humans do tend to eat when we are emotional. And if you're eating foods that are good for you, okay. It probably wasn't necessary, but you just may not be hungry again for a little while. It's fine. You ate steak. You were sad. You ate steak. Good for you. But learning to deal with the heart of the issue. What am I really feeling? And what would really fix this right now? If meat isn't the solution, then hunger wasn't the problem. And if true hunger isn't your problem, no food is ever going to solve it. Next tip. Remember this. These cravings will pass. It is temporary. The first week that an alcoholic gets off of alcohol, 
they feel like for the rest of their life, all they will ever think about is alcohol. But it's just not true. The voice of addiction, what Dr. Joan Iflin calls the lizard brain, will tell you this will last forever. I will never stop screaming in your ear until you eat the thing. It's a lie. It's just a lie. It will go away as long as you stay abstinent from the substance. Every time we go back, that voice of addiction is just going to scream louder the next time. Treat those cravings like you would a toddler pitching a fit for something that you know is bad for them. A toddler screaming and hollering in the line because they want gummy bears. No. And if you say no every time, their screaming will get less and less because they learn that you mean business and it will stop. But every time you give in and say, okay, this one time I'll buy you the gummy bears, think what you're doing. You are just confirming, rewarding that behavior and it's going to make it worse and harder in the future to break them of this. Same for your own cravings. Stay solid. No means no. It is not best for me. So I'm not doing it. And these cravings will pass. It'll hit you like a wave. And then the wave will pass. Do something in that few to several minutes. Do something. Going outside. Getting sunlight. Turning on the music. Taking that walk. We've talked about a few hundred times now. <laughs> All of this will buy you time for that wave to pass. It will get better. And the waves will become fewer and fewer and fewer until eventually it's like oh, a little splash. Psst. <laughs> no big deal. Next, I'm going to encourage you to have really clear parameters for exactly what you know is best for you. And then don't let anybody else's opinion change that. So I know for sure that having anything sweet at this point would light up my brain and take me right back to sugar addiction, which if I was back on sugar, I would go right back to getting the results that I was getting before. And that's not what I want. So no matter what anyone says to me, they might say, oh, Kelly, I'm so glad you came to our event. I made something sugar free just for you. And a part of me is going to want to eat that. Because I love people and I want to please them and I don't want to make anyone feel bad and I don't want to disappoint them. But also, I know that that doesn't work for me and it's a parameter I've set for myself. And just like if I went to a party and they were passing out cocaine, I would have no problem saying, oh, I'm sorry, I don't do that. I could very kindly say whatever it is, whether they've made me a giant plate of asparagus because they heard that I was keto and they assume that that's going to work for me. They don't know about my digestion. I could let them know why I can't have asparagus because of my IBS issues. They may not know I was a recovering sugar addict and what sweet tastes do. I can explain all of that. I could just graciously take some, not eat it, and then thank them. But what I'm not going to do is hurt myself and send myself backwards to a place I don't want to be just to please other people. Because the fact is, you can never please everybody. You can maybe please this one sugar pusher today, but there'll be another one tomorrow. And if we keep that up, the person who is going to be the least pleased, is just going to be yourself. There were people who were thrilled when I cut out sugar and started losing weight, and they were like, yes, you go, girl. You look great. Good for you. And then there were people who were really disappointed that I wasn't eating dessert with them. You can't please everybody. Do what is best for your body and surround yourself with people who really do want you to feel good. I would also like to mention one of the greatest tips I can possibly give you is get some support. Having five interactions per day with people who are on the path that you want to be on is the most researched, successful way to break an addiction, five per day. So if you're in a group where you have carnivore support, you can interact with five of these people per day. In my groups, we have a completely private Facebook group. I also send emails. I post videos for them. We share with one another what works. We have meetings in the Zoom class, but also if you're not in a group, you can go on YouTube, watch carnivore YouTubers, read books about health and how to get insulin down, watch Dr. Ben Bickman, Dr. Ken Berry, talk about the reasons. And if you interact with five people who have already broken the addiction that you have, five people per day on average, you are far more likely to break 
this addiction yourself and to be successful forever. Also, if you've tried before and have fallen off the wagon or fallen into the ditch, gone back to the carbs, please hear me out. It also takes an average of five total restarts for most people to break any addiction, whether that's smoking or sugar five total restarts. So if you've already had a few of those, maybe even more than five, this does not make you a failure. It just means that every time we go back, learn from the pain that you experienced. How does it hurt you? Focus on that. Not only I'm such a bad person. I should have done this. I shouldn't have eaten that. Shame, shame, shame. Stop with the guilt and the shame. What did you learn from that? How did it hurt you? How is it holding you back? What do you really want? And then go for that. Focus on the pain and then give yourself a plan. Remember, your desperation is actually a huge asset to your success. Okay, that's it for me today. Thank you for joining me. If you're willing to, hit the thumbs up. Share if you think this could help anybody else. Comment below to let me know how you are personally doing right now on this leg of your journey. Did, did you make it through the cravings? How did you do it? Did cutting out the sweet taste help you as much as it helped me? I would love to know. All right, I will see you guys next time. Bye.